education is a privilege often taken for granted. While its fruits are celebrated, its bitter struggles are often overlooked. Hundred fifty years ago, a great experiment began, but not all believed it could succeed. A school for the promotion of agriculture and mechanic arts, located in the great American desert, with nothing in sight more suggestive of enlightened civilization than dry prairies dotted with cactus patches, bestrewn with bleaching bones of departed buffalo, and inhabited by prairie dogs, coyotes, and buzzards, with only here and there a little oasis along the creek bottoms, is an enterprise both amusing and pathetic. While newcomers saw the unforgiving landscape inhospitable, there were others who flourished on this land and considered it sacred. Bita awa kabhod, bita awa betan ta hat do hena hatchigani tani da bahati. Before this land was given to anybody, it was our ancestral home. For the Arapaho people, our ancestral homeland is actually a place where all of our stories and our creation stories, our traditional knowledge comes from the plants, the animals, our star knowledge, a lot of that history comes from this area. We have a variety of folks coming through here in the last 500 years or so. Athabascan populations like the Apache and Navajo or Diné peoples, Comanches, Kiowas, uh, and then beginning in the 19th century, other groups like the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, as well as Lakota peoples. Uh, coming across the mountains from the west, or various bands of the Ute. But as time goes on, as we get closer to the present, uh, we have a whole variety of groups that come through this area because this really is the crossroads of the continent. After the discovery of gold in Colorado in the 1850s, there were simply more people coming in that could be accommodated right, in a peaceful way and they're moving into this country that's now being occupied by the China and Arapaho. And so conflicts started to emerge. When you talk about territories at that time, there weren't fences put up. There, were, there weren't boundaries in certain areas that you tribes called as their own. The land was very important to them because it provided all their sustenance as well as their spirituality. And so just because there wasn't a title to this property didn't mean that it wasn't deep connections to this place. It was exactly what my great grandma had said. Once people knew that there was gold here, the exploration of gold took the land out of our hands. Uh, here in Fort Collins, though, we had the Northern Arapaho, who, led by Chief Friday, who wanted to establish their own reservation right here along the Poudre River. As the Army and U.S. settlers increasingly occupied these spaces, there was less available for indigenous peoples. In 1861, an act of Congress declared Colorado as a territory. Eventually, Chief Friday and his people would be forced to move north to the Wind River Reservation. By the 1870s, 1880s, you get more people who are immigrating from Scandinavia, from Germany, and they began to uh, farm and homestead. 
Camp Collins was officially founded as an army outpost to protect travel and mail on the Overland Trail as it traveled from Denver north back up into Wyoming. And that was a boon for the agriculturalists. They began to supply the fort, which needed agricultural products uh, with its necessities. Economic development at that time was pioneering. That was the manifest destiny of non-natives. For the Arapaho, we did not know what was coming. In 1861, as the Civil War raged and the turmoil erupted in the United States, a group of congressmen focused on an ingenious plan, not for battle, but rather for education. Vermont Representative Justin Smith Morrill led the charge. Justin Morrill was the son of a blacksmith who had wanted to go to college, had never had that opportunity. And when the idea was presented to him to foster a bill around education for the working class children of the agricultural industrial classes, he was very enthused about that. On July 2nd, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Morrill Land Grant Colleges Act. Congress granted each state the equivalent of 30,000 acres of federal land to fund colleges. And they found a way to create universities that were created by the sale of land and these universities could establish themselves and then be open to regular people. Fundamentally at the core of the Morrill Act was the idea, the quintessentially American idea, that anyone with the talent and the motivation to earn a degree from a great university should have that opportunity. 69 land-grant colleges were initially founded to teach agriculture and the mechanical arts. One of the reasons why many of them started out as being focused on agriculture and what they called then the mechanical arts was to really meet people where they were and they understood that farmers were constantly trying to solve problems. While the North and South were being torn in half by war, the outpost of Camp Collins in the West was under siege from a different threat. In 1st of June, 1864, what Ansel Watchers called a great body of water came down from the mountains, the Poudre River overflowed, the camp was inundated. Nobody died, but some of the soldiers just barely escaped with their lives. So it was declared that they needed a new location on higher ground. So they chose the higher ground, which became Fort Collins, and nobody quite knows why we went from camp to fort, except it just sounded a little more distinguished. In 1865, the Civil War ended, and the Southern states returned to the Union. Well, not surprisingly, uh, the end of the war didn't eliminate racial tensions within America. We're still dealing and struggling with those to this very day. But at that particular point in time, there were concerns that the southern states would still find ways um, to racially segregate and to not permit access. So the Second Moral Act brought in 19 historically black colleges and universities, tied those into the land-grant system, and provided, um, even if everything else failed, a direct open door for African-American students to attend uh, a land-grant college. The other thing that happens is that the Union focused on uh, defeating the Confederacy during the, the Civil War, developed a large-scale, uh, very efficient fighting machine. So all of that was turned on the Western Plains tribes in the aftermath of the Civil War. Strategically, weapon-wise, they out, outdid us. In 1870, we were slowly finally getting pushed out of Colorado and Fort Collins.
Camp Collins was decommissioned in 1867. Some of the soldiers stayed on and the community was sufficiently established as an agricultural community. The settlers and the local merchants and others who, who live here start wondering, what are we gonna do to make this a successful city? I think you really have to call them visionaries. They saw a future that most other people didn't see. There's always something special about Fort Collins, and that's why I think it always had the Choice City label. But life here wasn't always as good. When Isabella Bird came here in 1872, she pronounced this little town positively disgusting. She said it was full of flies and had coarse food, coarse people, coarse everything. She didn't see why anybody would ever want to live here. Lack of rainfall and even more so uncertainty of rainfall were challenges to the first agriculturalists in the area. There was a serious drought between 1872 and 1875. That's part of what the agricultural colleges were for, to help figure out better ways to deal with agricultural mishaps, agricultural catastrophes. Nobody knew much about anything like irrigation or dealing with infestations. The interesting thing to me is that in the early to mid-1870s, you had plagues of grasshoppers came through. It was so bad that people would hang clothes out on clotheslines and the grasshoppers would eat them. People got very discouraged. The earliest newspaper, The Express, said the population was 600. The next year it was 400. It looked like the town of Fort Collins was gonna just go away. It was just not gonna succeed. If Fort Collins was to survive, the land-grant college needed to come here. There was a thought in several Colorado communities to be uh, the home for this new university, but Fort Collins really stepped forward. In 1870, nearly six years before Colorado would become a state, Fort Collins was legislated as the official site of Colorado's State Agricultural College. Cities up and down the Front Range were popping up and disbanding and uh, rising and falling. Leaders of Fort Collins wanted to secure their future. There was a group of people, a man named Loveland, for one, who were invested in having a train here from Denver. The train would bring people, it would bring goods, it would take goods for trade, and they considered it critically important. In 1877, the Colorado Central Railroad came and said, can we lay, you know, tracks through your town? Can we build a railroad? Well, duh, <laughs> yeah, a rail connection with the Transcontinental Railroad? Please, you know, what can we give you? Yeah. So they said, you know, hey, we'll, we'll give you a right of way forever. As fate would have it, William F. Watrous now led Colorado's first Board of Agriculture, a board of local farmers dedicated to building the college. Watrous struck a deal with the railroad for $100, and the train began rolling through town. It ran right through campus. And when I tell people that when that train came down the track on Mason Street, everybody cheered, they just laughed. They can't even imagine it. Today we get stopped and swear that long trains are coming through. And so when people say, well, why don't we just move it out east of town or move it somewhere else? You know, the railroad doesn't have to move it. You know, they've got the right of way forever. You know, historically, it was, it was the town savior, actually. It wasn't long before Watrous had another urgent matter at hand. 
Citizens of Boulder and Greeley sought to have the State Agriculture College relocated to their respective towns. Overnight, a wagon and oxen delivered quarried stones from the foothills. The members of the Grange plowed the land and built the first claim building. The tiny building laid claim to the land and ensured the college would remain in Fort Collins. Four years later, a second, more substantial building was constructed. In 1879, excitement was growing. The school had two buildings and was in search of its first president. They found at McKendry College in Illinois, uh, Elijah Edwards. Elijah Edwards was here because they didn't know what else to look for in terms of a first president. He was a Civil War chaplain and a man of vast experience and faith. But he was about to face a host of challenges for which he was not fully equipped. The State Board of Agriculture, they began uh, thinking, how do we uh, begin building this little college? They had models, fortunately, in Michigan, what we now know as Michigan State University. That was the land grant there. They were already had uh, discussions and even arguments about what do we offer. So you had a very strong lobby of agriculturalists, especially cattlemen, who said we should be teaching farming and not anything else. I have a sense that it wasn't formalized in its structure. Uh, and maybe the best practices that we see in boards today weren't exactly followed by that State Agricultural Board. On the other hand, President Edwards believed the college should provide a broader and more diverse education. The differing philosophies would be a defining struggle for the school. It was very shortly thereafter they hired two more gentlemen uh, to, make, to round out the faculty of, of three to greet the very first students that were to start college on the uh, 1st of September of 1879. Elijah Edwards' two daughters were both enrolled along with a handful of other students. But that handful grew to 10 and then 15 and 20 as, as people uh, realized the college was operating and began sending their kids in. Women going to college was a whole new concept that very few people knew how to deal with. There were maybe a, a dozen colleges in the whole country that admitted women. And now here came these land grant colleges. Women could go. With changing times came a change in the name of the college. In 1880, the State Agricultural College became Colorado Agricultural College. Understanding what could grow in Colorado was one of the main missions for the Land Grant College. Experimental crops were planted on the college farm to find out. They uh, went and got various uh, types of seed, planted uh, some uh, part of the college farm with tobacco, and they were able to actually grow tobacco out here in Fort Collins, Colorado. I think the uh, state board members, the men, uh, they uh, all probably got one of these cigars, fired it up, and uh, discovered that the tobacco tasted terrible. I like to tell my students that if they had been in the first class at Colorado State University, they would have had a labor requirement. Yeah, that tuition was really nothing. And so it was about working and earning your keep in order to be able to learn. They would have had to slop the pigs and milk the cows and shovel manure and tend the fires and sweep the floor. Besides labor, the university required money. Hay and crops were sowed from the college farm to fund agricultural research. Professor Ainsworth Blunt managed the farm and he began to share research with Colorado farmers. At first, not all were receptive. An early meeting blew up as one farmer still held a grudge over the college being established in Fort Collins over Greeley. These Farmer Institute meetings bridged the gap between farmers and educators and became the cooperative extension service that exists today. 
part of the Extension Service's role and responsibility was to help those farmers understand the opportunities uh, and the best practices that were associated with it. And the Extension Service began to fit that bill. It was unique in that it was a partnership too with the local communities. The great experiment was beginning to have the impact its founders had dreamed, but its outreach was still limited. I think they realized right away that they needed to have some kind of, of living facilities uh, to attract people to send their children up here to go to this agricultural college. Consequently, the board authorized the construction of Spruce Hall, and Edwards oversaw the operation. After just one year at Fort Collins, Edwards fully sensed the frustration of his position. In a letter to a friend dated June 7, 1880, he declared, I've been here a year and have been successful, though I shall not pledge myself to remain, unless I find a greater measure than now seems possible in schools of this class. They are experiments at best, and experiments, I must confess, a little out of my line. Edwards would resign nearly two years later, and the Agriculture Board would begin its search for the next college president. Three consecutive presidents would forge the major foundation of the school over the next 27 years. Charles L. Ingersoll, Austin Ellis, and Barton O. Ellsworth. Beneath their distinguished mustaches, they shared other commonalities. All were ministers and articulate scholars with academic philosophies learned at Midwest colleges. And like their predecessor, Elijah Edwards, they would battle the school's board for a broader curriculum. It was a battle that took several, literally decades to decide what direction they were gonna finally go with. George Glover, Libby Coy, and Leonidas Loomis were three local kids that managed to complete their studies by the spring of 1884. They became the first graduating class and formed the Alumni Association. Land-grant universities became not only places of incredible education, but also focused on how to solve challenges. Well, they say whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. There was this amazing engineering professor, Professor Mead, and Lake Mead is actually named after him. Elwood Mead was a brilliant man. He saw an opportunity to develop not only irrigation facilities, but a whole concept of irrigation law. Known as the engineer who made the desert bloom, Mead pioneered water management in the West. Escaping to Colorado in 1882 was the infamous gunslinger, Doc Holliday. While hiding from the law, he decided to stay in Colorado to avert an even deadlier adversary. Doc had tuberculosis, and the only refuge for his symptoms was the high, dry, sunny air of Colorado. By the end of the century, a third of the people in Colorado were TB patients and families. Still, little was known about the nation's most deadly disease. Dr. George Henry Glover, one of the CAC's first graduates and leader of the new Department of Veterinary Science, realized that diseased beef and milk were infecting humans. He fought to educate the public. He kind of did a very uh, right in your face kind of thing. Here's the horrible mess that you people are actually trying to consume as milk that is really a very badly infected substance that you wouldn't feed to anybody. They, a lot of times, didn't understand how unsafe it was to have, and the tuberculosis was spread that way. As a result, Dr. Glover drafted an ordinance for food inspections that became a motto for cities across the nation. It was food experimentation rather than inspection that created a boom in Colorado's economy at the time. We're fortunate that the Hatch Act passed in 1887. And the Hatch Act gave uh, birth to the Ag Experiment Stations uh, around the state of Colorado. 
Colorado is a word in Spanish. It's not like all of a sudden Hispanic Latino folks showed up. Think about the Spanish conquest in the 1500s. We can trace our roots back to that greatest influx of uh, Mexicanos, Mexican folks, to Fort Collins specifically and Larimer County was a result of the sugar beet farming. The sugar beet industry was one of the things that became a uh, uh, literally a mainstay for the economy of the state of Colorado by research that was done around the, at the various experiment stations growing different kinds of uh, sugar beets and finding out which ones grew well. And that turned out to be a big boon for the economy of, of the young state of Colorado. There was a variety of wheat that became the kind of wheat consumed in bread products uh, came out of Colorado Agricultural College. It was said that these two crops provided Colorado with more money in one year than all of the mining that had been done in the state. Education for all under the Morrill Act was paying off. One of the things that was incredible about Colorado State University is it admitted women from the very beginning, um, which was unusual for some of the land-grant universities. They were focused basically on men. During President Ingersoll's first term, 24 of the 67 students enrolled were female. Ingersoll felt it was important to hire a female faculty member. Elizabeth Bell became the first, followed by her sister Maud. Colorado soon became one of the first two states to grant women the right to vote. State of Wyoming actually was the very first, but Colorado was shortly right there behind him. It was in 1893, 27 years before the 19th Amendment in the United States. Women were the ones that made settlement possible. They were strong, they were tough, they were resilient, they were brave, they were remarkable. Among the remarkable women was Eliza Rout, the state's first female voter and wife of Colorado's governor. Eliza Rout became the first female member of the board. Eliza hired her friend, Theodosia Ammons, who shared her passion for women's equal rights in education. Together, they built the foundation for the colleges of domestic economy, home economics, and consumer science. Virginia H. Corbett became the Dean of Women further championing the rights of female students. Colorado Agricultural College had become a place of opportunity for many seeking a brighter future. In 1891, Grafton St. Clair Norman became the first African-American at the school. He enrolled right after the third president uh, came and was hired, who was Alston Ellis. Alston Ellis was an educator from uh, Hamilton, Ohio. And it just so happened that Grafton was also from Hamilton, Ohio. He was the quartermaster in the military uh, department in the, the Corps of Cadets, which was a fairly high rank to hold. He actually graduated and went on to become a mathematics uh, professor at, at a college level. While history was being made, the Collegian newspaper began publishing. One article described the student's first encounter with running water. One of the young men in the short course, while investigating the shower bath in the lavatory, stepped under the shower with his street clothes on and turned on the water. Imagine the result. Modern utilities and buildings were transforming the campus at the turn of the century. The college now had 345 students and 33 faculty. A sense of community and spirit was growing. By 1892, military training as part of the land-grant tradition had been well established on campus. As students mastered military drills, they sought new ways to test their physical strength and discipline. The students uh, got together and they said, we want to have uh, athletics. Athletics grew, but the school's newly appointed president, Austin Ellis, was not a fan. He thought they should be uh, more interested in uh, military or into other types of activities on the college farm. But the students really wanted to play football. The first football game on January 7th, 1893, presented the team with a unique challenge. 
the boys went down to Longmont to play uh, Longmont Academy in a, what was considered the very first football game, and they needed some way of identifying themselves. They didn't have uniforms, so they stopped in a drugstore and they happened to have some green ribbon and some orange ribbon. They bought enough of it to each pin on their shirts, those two uh, colors of ribbons. That's where the uh, colors of green and gold or green and orange uh, happened. President Ellis continued to be unsupportive of athletics, especially football. After he departed, they brought in Barton Aylesworth. And Dr. Aylesworth was very much opposite in a mindset. He supported sports and the region's first athletic conference. So on Thanksgiving Day, 1899, uh, the Aggies go up to Laramie for the very first, what we would call the border war today. The Border War is one of the longest standing rivalries in the United States in football between Colorado State and Wyoming. During the first game, the rivalry almost ended before it began. There's an argument over the rules, and the Wyoming referee takes the rule book, slaps it out of the umpire's hand, and he says, damn with the rules. This game is over. The Colorado Aggies vowed to never play Wyoming again, but they did one year later, and this time their coach, George Toomey, would play in the game. And Toomey was a very good uh, athlete. So he was not only a coach, but he was a player. Well, Wyoming didn't like the fact that our coach was playing. So they would not only tackle him, but they would pile on top of him and punch him and kick him. And, and they literally broke his uh, collarbone and, and took him out of the game. The Aggies arose victorious, and a bitter rivalry began. Under President Ellsworth, athletics continued to excel, and Durkee Athletic Field was built. And they played not just football there, but they had the track and they had the baseball all on that one spot. Taking to the field was Alfred Johnson, the first African-American athlete in Colorado Agricultural College history. University of Denver saw that uh, Alfred Johnson was gonna play against him, and they said, nope, we're not gonna play him. We, we don't play against black players. And it caused a real problem within the, uh, the entire Rocky Mountain region. Perhaps the most celebrated team of the era was the women's basketball team, who in 1903 brought home the school's first championship in collegiate athletic competition. Over the last 20 years, the total number of Colorado firms had nearly doubled to 46,000, and the population had grown by 48%. How in the world did those people hang on and survive? I think they're amazing. I think they're admirable. And I think that's my favorite part about the history. The roots of Colorado Agricultural College were now firmly planted on the plains of what William Watchers and others had once called the Great American Desert. A new era was on the horizon. The Oval first took shape in 1910 as part of a nationwide experiment. At that time, the United States was, was just getting into the automobile age, and across the country, the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture was very interested in getting uh, each of the uh, land-grant schools particularly to do experimental work on trying to build roads using materials that were local. The road was built and quickly became the center of campus. Kind of had a romance about it just because of the uh, beauty and uh, the, the shade of those uh, big old trees and the whole ambiance of the place. We have trees on the oval that were planted in 1881. The uh, elms were probably the size of this glass, the trunk, you know, and now they're a huge thing. But in 1970, 
we had what they call the Dutch elm disease that came into Fort Collins. And so a lot of those trees in the oval were lost. Thanks to arborists like Carl Jorgensen, many trees survive today at over 100 years old. They remain silent witnesses to the rise of the Oval's historic buildings under the leadership of CSU's longest serving president. Charles Laurie was here for 31 years, going from 1909 to uh, 1940. As a farmer and educated physicist, he promoted both hands-on learning and classical academics. It is an old but true saying, he once asserted, that there is much culture in a beet root as in a Greek root. Laurie's philosophy and down-to-earth persona won the trust of the Board of Agriculture, and he became the first president to expand education into liberal arts and beyond. Growth, however, was not without struggle. We had different, you know, waterborne diseases that uh, hit the campus, particularly during the late 1800s and very early 1900s. Typhoid was so severe, parents became wary of sending their children to Colorado State College. A man carrying a cistern supplied water to students. He had one tin cup which all students shared. In 1914, President Lurie led a group of dignitaries on a 50-mile journey into the Rockies via steam-powered automobile and horse-drawn wagon. He arrived at what is now the CSU Mountain Campus, eventually purchasing it for $1.25 per acre. The Act of Congress gave Colorado Agricultural College at the time the opportunity to come up and select the tracts of land to start a forestry field camp. On a 12,000 foot mountain peak to the south, Inga Allison was unloading portable ovens from her Model T to test the science of high altitude baking. Even at a very early stage in the evolution of um, what would become Colorado State University, we were very attuned to women's education, but also um, the infusion of science and research. In 1927, Charles Lorry used his physics knowledge to engineer a pressurized laboratory where high altitude recipes could be tested without leaving campus. The brilliance of the experiments that Inga Allison and um, Charles Lorry did were to elevate this to not just guesswork, but actual science, and that's informed our cooking to this day. Ralph Parshall ran the first hydraulics lab at the college and was searching for a solution to another pressing problem. In a semi-arid environment, a very dry environment that we have in Colorado, uh, we had to find a way to be able to allocate water um, so that we wouldn't have disputes that would take place. The invention of the Parshall flume in 1914 provided an accurate way to measure water and settle disputes. In 1917, when male students were called to fight in World War I, the survival of the college and the nation relied on women. They knew right away when the United States entered the war that food production was going to be a very vital part of whether the uh, Allies were going to win the war or lose to Germany. Many times it was women who began to steward the land. It was a, a horrible war. After Germany surrendered in 1918, soldiers returned to campus, bringing with them unseen enemies. Now they call it PTSD, but I would imagine that they must have come back so traumatized that it would have been very difficult for them to resume normal life. Soldiers also suffered from the deadly 1918 flu. The pandemic took over campus and the field house became an infirmary. Over 50 million people died worldwide, more than double those in the war.
the wounds of war began to ease with music and entertainment that came to campus. Ticket prices were a staggering $2. For those with more refined taste, the Army and ROTC provided a new resounding form of entertainment. Kabam, we had a cannon. And uh, that's what we're still using that to this day. Blasting comatose the cannon was not the only way Fort Collins celebrated game day victories, however. They made a newsreel film of this 1919 game. We just happened to absolutely annihilate CU in that game, which was great. You had the, the fans walking down College Avenue all in a parade. And then you also see the, the rarest of them all, and that's our, our bear, that was our, uh, um, our mascot in 1919, and only in 1919. A decade of unruly mascots paved the way for the athletic legends to come. In 1936, Glenn Morris dominated the decathlon at the Berlin Olympics. He, he grew up in a very hard scrabble life in, in, in the, you know, the Dust Bowl era and, and came to CSU as a, a great student, but also a really phenomenal athlete. After winning gold, Morris won a spot on the silver screen. He was a much better athlete than actor by any stretch of the imagination and still considered maybe the worst of the Tarzan movies. As Morris made headlines, the 31-year career of President Lorry was drawing to a close. Povito Lovato was about to become the school's first Hispanic graduate as Colorado Agricultural College became Colorado A&M in 1935. Arriving at Colorado State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts in 1939 was John Mosley. I didn't go up there to, to just to play football and to wrestle. I went up there to get an education. He was the student body vice president twice at CSU. Think about that. He was one of, I believe, seven African Americans on campus. And at that time, that was anything but an easy thing to be in on a college campus or in American society. We stuck together, the five of us that uh, rented a house. They called themselves the Lonesome Boys. We couldn't go into the restaurants. We had to stick together in order to survive. He was very brave to be here. Mosley's friends feared for his safety on the football field and urged him not to play. I hate a quitter. And uh, throughout the football games, I never stopped fighting. Before a game in Salt Lake City, a movie theater attempted to have him outcast. Mosley goes up to Harry Hughes and he says, uh, uh, Coach, I'm going to go up to the balcony. They won't let me sit with the team uh, because I'm black. Hughes got up and he said, all right, Aggies, we're all leaving. Uh, they don't uh, want uh, Mosley to sit with us. And so he got up and he left. There must be equality, there must be fairness. To accomplish that, you have to be honest. On the 7th of December, I decided to go up and have my picnic up on the Rock A, which stood for Aggies. And on the way up there on my bicycle with my lunch, somebody came and said, said the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Repercussions of the 1941 attack rattled students and leaders at Colorado A&M. The United States was suddenly entrenched in World War II. I went down and, uh, to the Navy officer and tried to enlist. Uh, all the young men who were here actually had to go to the uh, local draft board and register for the draft. I had to fight in order to be able to fight for this country. With an Oakwood attitude, John Mosley taught himself to fly, then repeatedly wrote letters to Congress to become a Tuskegee Airman. The males were drawn out of our college to go into the service. Females became the majority. It really moved beyond just the, the traditional home economics uh, type of role. The student population dropped by half to 700. And Roy M. Green, the college's new president, worked nonstop to keep the campus running. He uh, 
uh, made the contacts with the, uh, the Department of Defense or the War Department and offered the services of the college and the classrooms and the teachers to do training for active duty Army personnel. The campus began to look more like a military base than a college. Every Wednesday, we had military drills. War and rumors of a Japanese mainland invasion cast a wave of fear and paranoia across the United States. Big signs went up at the stores. Japanese-American students at Colorado A&M became unwelcome at local shops. American students, they got the list of groceries that we needed and they went to the store and brought the food after dark so that nobody could see what was being done. Soon, an executive order by Franklin D. Roosevelt forced 120,000 Japanese Americans to internment camps. There were concentration camps in my mind, and that was a that was a that was a horrible experience. The country needed farmers, and since my father was in the farm business, and I was the oldest one, I was uh, deferred. Years later, President Roosevelt's most outspoken critic came to CSU to deliver the commencement at her grandson's graduation. Eleanor Roosevelt landed at an airfield named after Bert Christman, a famed cartoonist and Aggie aviator of World War II. The war ended in 1945, and Congress rewarded soldiers for their service, setting aside funds for education. When the men came back, uh, there was a huge increase in the interest in college again because of the GI Bill. 190 Quonset huts housed an influx of new students. The campus and town were changing once again. My parents used to call Fort Collins a, a town of broad streets and narrow minds. It was very conservative. When the veterans came back, they were worldly. They just completely opened up the culture of Fort Collins. Returning to society was not easy for all veterans of World War II. Many were physically and mentally wounded. One of the, the outcomes of uh, men coming back from war was the evolution of fields like occupation therapy. Really, they were focusing on going to school as part of a rehab program. In 1946, enrollment was increasing, and the future of Colorado A&M looked bright. President Roy Green sat down at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver for a well-deserved drink. There was a uh, deranged ex-former soldier. He came in, he started shooting wildly, and one of the bullets, unfortunately, struck uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Green. Green survived, but was weakened and died two years later. That was a devastating moment uh, for this college campus. Upon President Green's sudden death, Isaac E. Newsom led Colorado A&M. Within a year, William E. Morgan took over. He uh, uh, made a statement very early on that he felt, felt by 1960 there would probably be 10 or 15,000 students. Morgan revealed an ambitious plan to meet the challenge. We intend to give your young men and women the best education possible. With these necessary added facilities, we can teach our students under more adequate conditions. The face of Colorado A&M was about to change forever. They kind of held a, uh, a contest uh, to say, let's name, name our new mascot, because they actually had a ram, but they, it wasn't Cam and uh, they came up with several names, and the name that actually won the thing was called Meathead. The name Meathead was a protest by diehard students who wanted to be called Aggies, not Rams. William E. Morgan, the new college president, overruled the name. He got up to the microphone and basically said, I want you to meet Cam the Ram. 
named for Colorado A&M, and our live mascot that we take great pride in. Aggie tradition turned to Ram Pride on May 1st, 1957, when Colorado A&M officially became Colorado State University. This had long since gone from just being an agricultural mechanical college. Juilliard trained musician and World War II veteran Wilfred Schwartz had come to CSU to teach music. In 1949, he formed the Fort Collins Symphony. Willard Eddy taught liberal arts, philosophy, and English to a generation about to experience one of the most turbulent times in history. We can experience things, but if we cannot communicate those, they're lost. And so I think that's what a liberal arts education does. It prepares you to be a good citizen and a good human being and a knowledgeable human being. With the rise in education came the rise of campus. Morgan's plan continued to unfold. He didn't want to be known for the, the president that built all the buildings, but you look at how many structures went up during the Morgan era, uh, not just your athletic facilities, but the library, the Clark Building, the, all the dormitories, everything else that, that, that sprouted up along this campus were the result of uh, William Morgan. Put names and buildings and courses money, marble, and chalk, mean nothing without students, and they were a lively bunch in both the living and the learning. had such an emphasis already in the domestic economy and thinking about different careers for women and elevating women in science. They did start adding some courses that gave women a potential for a career. That's when the first business-related type of courses began. Gladys Eddy became a dominant part of the new business college, bringing in influential speakers in business and politics. At the time, a full master's degree in business could be earned through engineering's distance learning program. Surge was a program whereby they sent out discs or tapes to businesses that were interested in getting a graduate degree. The first computers on campus appeared in the 1950s. The mainframe was a CDC 6400. That was in a secure area. We were not allowed back in there. Paper punch cards were used to program the machine. You get one card wrong and it spits it out and you have to go back to a card a punch and, and, and do some more cards. And, or if you dropped them, it was, uh, it was hopeless, so you had to kind of start all over. There's more power in your iPhone or my iPhone than there was in probably that CDC 6400. A legacy of research contracts began to bring wealth and notoriety to Colorado State University. Engineering student A.R. Chamberlain earned the school's first PhD. And Jack Zormack, who was professor at that time at CSU and, and built the very first boundary layer wind tunnel in the United States, uh, was asked to do a uh, wind load study. So the original wind tunnel testing for the Twin Towers in New York was done at Colorado State. And that's really the start of wind engineering of tall buildings globally. Jack Cermak, John Paterka, Bob Maroney, Bogus Biankovic, these, these guys, you know, you had a whole department of wind engineers. The technology that was developed at CSU, the thinking, the engineering approaches, they're still the same ones we're using today. In 1957, the Soviet launch of the world's first satellite fueled U.S. scientific and engineering research. Money poured into CSU, helping build Colorado State University's Foothill Research Campus. 
As the atomic age fueled science and world tension, CSU's Research Foundation promoted a mission for world peace. In 1961, the Peace Corps was established from a feasibility study done by Andrew Rice, Colleen Berkey Kreutzer, and Maurice Albertson. KCSU Campus Radio began broadcasting, and news of the Cuban Missile Crisis, civil rights, and the Vietnam War had Americans on edge. Many, including those at CSU, did not feel their voices were being heard. They were demanding a lot of different things, and one of them was the freedom to have beer in the student center. From 1896 until 1969, we were a dry town. The Association of Students of Colorado State organized a protest. Let's bring the beer onto campus and drink it in public and uh, uh, show the administrators that uh, we're, we're serious. The beer in worked. Fort Collins became famous for its beer culture, and in 2013, CSU became the first university in the nation to offer a degree in fermentation science and technology. Protests for more important change grew louder. Women, the disabled, and people of color demanded social justice. Well, they were angry because the university did not, did not represent the demographics of the state. Are you going to bring them in? Are you going to bring them in? Bob water, 1960? None. We're going to get some students in here. 400 black and 400 Chicano. I, I have tried to explain to you that there just can't be a wand waving by some administrator or even a board. Black students are, are, are not shy about speaking up for their needs and their respect. There's a place here because we've made it a place here. Across the country, specifically during that time, is when many cultural centers were being created on college campuses. Always been out of advocacy from students, students coming forward saying, this is what we want, um, this is what we need, and we continue to see much of that today. After 20 years, William Morgan realized that the university had grown beyond his wildest dreams. He had a tough time with the way that the, the college was changing during the Vietnam War. The 60s and the 70s were very volatile times all across the country, including here on, on the CSU campus. There were so many of the students going off to war and not coming back, or coming back and being very, very different. On May 8, 1970, students rallied to protest the Vietnam War. We were all there talking about the importance of having a cause. I remember the conversation vividly. Not long after the rally, Old Main burst into flames. It seemed that the whole of Fort Collins was on fire, and it was so frightening. Who did it? What's this about? There was some thought that it might be related to the, the protests about the war. Others had different opinions. No one died, but Old Maine was in ashes. Only bricks remained. Bricks from the remains were used to build a Vietnam-era memorial bridge near the Student Center. Joining the list of well-known campus buildings in the 1970s was the Veterinary Teaching Hospital. However, it was a different facility that stole center stage for much of the decade. Hey, Hugh Stadium, Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, it was phenomenal. And uh, Elton John flew in on a helicopter In 1976, Bob Dylan recorded his live album, Hard Rain, at Hughes Stadium. 
As decades passed, a long list of other artists came to campus. Uh, in the early 80s, we started starting to see uh, computers appear on faculty's desks. Sometimes you would sit before a keyboard and people would literally shake because I'm afraid I'm going to break something. I remember talking to the chief financial officer at the institution at the time, and his attitude was, oh, there's just no way that anybody needs computers on their desks, you know? This should not be a university expense. This is a luxury. And, and that was just insane thinking. The instructional services team kept them running. Classes would start at 8, and the phone would start ringing about 10 till 8, people having problems in classrooms. CSU classrooms became the first in Colorado to have high-definition displays, yet old-school ways persisted. We still got people who will show up with analog, and uh, there's still people that want to use an overhead projector too, so that's, that's, it's a transition that's, that's still going on. Today, Colorado State University Online is roughly a $40 million operation. We're an information society today. You can go online, you can study, you can get a certificate, you can get a degree. The agricultural programs were very strong. Veterinary school was one of the top two or three in the country. So I wanted to emphasize that this was going to be a major university, not just an agricultural uh, cow college, as it was called at the time. A well-known art collector named John Powers helped the university bring in legendary artists. John would call up Andy Warhol and say, Andy, I need you to come out. Warhol visits to CSU forged unlikely friendships. Soon more artists came to Colorado State. During that time, we would follow them around with a video camera, doing oral histories, asking about why they did what they did and how they did it. But I tell everybody not to go into painting because I don't, nobody wants it anymore, I don't think. It's more creative uh, in, in video now to be more experimental and, and do art pieces. And Warhol's popularity was larger than life and students were excited to welcome him. So they went out and they bought these enormous pipes. Andy showed up and there were three huge soup cans sitting in the front yard and he loved them and he signed them. And this, both locally and nationally, put us on the map as being an institution that values the arts, in this case, as well as the sciences and agriculture. Between 1969 and 2019, the dedication and foresight of six presidents built Colorado State University into a world-class institution. Shaped by society, technology, and international conflict, the great experiment attracted great minds and produced great achievements. The legacy of CSU astronauts advanced space exploration. Dr. Bill Gray pioneered hurricane research and forecasting. In 1991, CSU professor Thomas Sutherland returned home, having been captured by terrorists in Beirut, tortured and held hostage for six years. Sutherland's fortitude inspired Fort Collins as it was about to endure a test of its own. On 
On the night of July 28, 1997, a flash flood tore through the center of campus just weeks before students were scheduled to begin class. In a race to repair more than 40 buildings, CSU's 12th president, Al Yates, led a massive recovery effort. That event served to create, to build, to enhance community within the institution. Included in $140 million of flood repairs came many meaningful improvements for disabled access. At Colorado State University, we must make an institutional commitment to creating and to providing opportunity. And we must demonstrate this commitment in resources and support services and above all in behavior. The 1990 American Disabilities Act provided funding. It was a non-discrimination kind of legislation and you cannot discriminate based on disability. For the first time in history, universities were required by law to provide access for the disabled. Access meant a change in facilities and attitudes, which attracted a new generation of disabled students. My admin assistant early on said, what, where are all, where are all these students coming from? Is there a, a plane flying up there saying, come to CSU? A CSU had itself a growth spurt due to a horrible uh, natural disaster. Overcoming the flood and then the dark days of 9-11, the bond between CSU and Fort Collins strengthened. It's hard to describe uh, what Fort Collins is without Colorado State University. Oftentimes, we don't fully appreciate the impact they're having not only in Fort Collins, but literally around the world. In 2003, a $20.1 million grant by philanthropist Fat Stryker helped build the University Center for the Arts and renovate Hughes Stadium. After Harry Hughes won the school's first conference championship in 1915, college football changed and the nation took notice. Many former Aggie players have gone on to national fame in the professional leagues. Among them, Jack Christensen, Dale Dodrell, Gary Glick, and Pum McGraw. All mastered the game from a legacy of top coaches until 1993. It has a rich history, but for me at the top of that list is Sonny Lubick. We came in as a staff. We did not have a team meeting room. So team meetings were held in the athletic center's boiler room. A hundred kids sitting on the floor, sitting on the floor, no air conditioning, no nothing, and they all had their shirts off, they're sweating. While the team prepared for their 11-game season, the university's interim athletic director wanted to make it 12. I said, well, go ahead, but make sure it's somebody we can beat. And he comes back to me a week later, when well, we got our 12th game. I said, yeah, who's that? He said, that is the University of Arizona. Arizona had been picked by Sports Illustrated to win the national championship that year. And I think our kids oh, are going to get murdered. <laughs> this is cruel. CSU went down in, to Arizona and beat them. It was an unbelievable thing to watch. Rams showing blitz. Here they come. And there's a fumble on the play. And Colorado State picks it up. Sean Moran. Sean Moran. He's at the 50. He's at the 40. He's at the 30. Uh, some of the skeptics were saying, well, maybe these guys do know a little bit. And that was really the game that put CSU football back on the map and made Sonny, brought Sonny into the limelight. CSU had not won a conference title in 40 years. By 2007, they had won six, with 20 players joining the NFL. But what Sonny had accomplished went far beyond football. He changed the dynamic of this institution. He's just a compassionate, helpful individual. And uh, I think that's why his teams, they would run through the wall, so to speak, for him. When I was growing up, I really didn't have um, too many you know, female role models. And uh, it's good to see all the kids coming out here knowing that they can talk to us and uh, learn from us if they want. And then even seeing the little boys come out asking for our autographs, that just shows the development of women's basketball. Basketball was invented in 1891 as a game for women. But we know how much effort and how much time it takes to be an athlete here at uh, Colorado State. Becky Hammond put CSU women's basketball on the map uh, as an All-American in the late 1990s. 
So I'm the problem, probably the smallest person out there most of the time. When it's out on the court, it's an all-out battle, and uh, you forget about everything else, and you go out there and, and you play your guts out. After playing professionally as one of the greatest players in WNBA history, she became the first female assistant coach in the NBA with the San Antonio Spurs. Her head coach, Greg Popovich, which is someone that, that bears great credibility and respect, says she'll be a head coach in the NBA soon. And I think she reflects kind of the Ram can-do attitude. Women's athletics has a history of unstoppable legends. Tom Hilbert in his outstanding coaching ability. Um, I remember when we beat Nebraska here, they were the number one ranked team in, uh, in volleyball. We came back and won three straight and beat them at home. Unbelievable. 8,000 people rushed, it was just a phenomenal thing. Track and field champions like Lillian Green, Barb Lawson, and Olympic gold medalist, Janae Deloach. I'm with Amy Van Dyken, who has just become the first woman in the history of the United States to win four gold medals in the same Olympics. Were you aware of that? No, I didn't know anything about it. Um, my coach had mentioned something, and I knew that three was getting close because people were talking about it, but um, I'm excited. That's really awesome. If you're not great forever. You just, it doesn't go that way. And if it did go that way, it wouldn't, it'd be too easy. Sonny's days as a coach have ended but his name remains part of CSU's new on-campus stadium. When the stadium was built in 2017, the university received a shocking donation. The director of the Alumni Association got a phone call from her husband saying, oh, you're not gonna believe this, but there's a bell in our driveway. It turns out that back in the early days of CSU, um, 1920 or so, a bunch of fraternity boys decided that it would be a fun thing to steal the bell out of the old main bell tower. The boys ended up burying the bell in a farm and in a twist of fate, saved it from burning in 1970. It had been buried for more than 40 years and all but forgotten. It now hangs in the bell tower outside the stadium ringing in memory of the school's past and sounding its hopes for the future. 1.5 billion dollars of improvements at Colorado State were made by folks that will never realize the benefits of those decisions. We really have rebuilt the campus in a way that I think will serve generations uh, of Rams to come. We have uh, places of uh, reflection, we have places of activity, where the great view to the mountains is revealed. These are spaces of a realization. In 2015, CSU became the world's first campus to achieve a STARS Platinum rating, recognizing the school's dedication to sustainability and the environment. I came to Colorado State University as a student, ooh, a long time ago, 1978, because CSU and the University of Wisconsin at Madison were the only two universities in the country offering degrees in solar engineering at that time. Today, a massive 30-acre solar array at the former Christman Airfield helps power Colorado State's campus. We have lofty goals. We want to be 100% renewable electricity by 2030. It's not just about reducing carbon. It's about being, doing that in a socially just way. One third of nearly 3,000 classes offered are sustainability related. Courses range from U.S. energy policy to immersive learning at the CSU Mountain Campus. What the Mountain Campus offers is one of the best living, learning laboratories we could offer our students. We have had that resource for over a hundred years now to instruct our students on natural resource management and issues. All of the old uh, buildings, they were built by the students themselves over time. Previous generations had at the core the same desires as our 21st century students. The desires to, to have immersive experiences are, I think, as strong as, as they were back then. The education that students get at the Mountain Campus and throughout all of our programs at Colorado State University provide that core that enable them to address some of the most important questions facing our planet today. In 2006, 
NASA teamed up with CSU atmospheric science engineers Graham Stevens and Thomas Vanderhaar to create CloudSat, the world's most sensitive cloud profiling radar. Extreme weather forecasting and climate research changed forever. If you fast forward and you look at the work that's being done now, we have faculty like Diana Wall doing critical work in Antarctica showing the effects of climate change. In my lifetime, there may be an erosion of the trust that public policy has in science. And so there's a compelling need to build that on the part of the land-grant university. Modern discoveries are being built on the past work of countless dedicated researchers at Colorado State, from George Glover in the 1870s to modern infectious diseases experts Ian Orm and Patrick Brennan. CSU has built the largest tuberculosis research team in the United States. Cancer treatments for animals and humans are being found at the world's largest animal cancer center, pioneered by Steve Withrow. Researcher Wayne McElwraith founded Colorado State University's Orthopedic Research Center, innovating groundbreaking medicine for both horses and humans, and methods to build disease-fighting compounds through synthetic organic chemistry were revolutionized by John Stilley and Al Myers. In 2009, Japan's emperor presented John Matsushima the emperor's citation for promoting quality beef in Japan, for pioneering steam flaking of corn, and for teaching some 10,000 animal science students at three universities. If there's somebody who's more iconic in the, in the brand for what Colorado State University is around innovative thinking, innovative minds, it's Temple Grandin. There's something about her, I think, that's different. Autistics tend to be visual thinkers. I think totally in pictures. By visualizing what a cow might see, one of Temple Grandin's innovations incorporates curve shoots to calm cattle as they approach slaughter. The stairway to heaven. Thing is, is they don't know. It's just another shoot. CSU needed an environmental philosopher, and I became that philosopher. And here was this canoe freak, tree hugger philosopher saying that these wild things have intrinsic value. Years later, Holmes Rolston was awarded the Templeton Prize by Prince Philip and forever crowned the father of environmental ethics. While research has the ability to define the future, it sometimes has the power to heal the past. If you kind of understand the history of what happened to the bison in this country, it's very similar to the history of what happened to Native people. 150 years ago, bison were facing extinction. Mass killing of bison was directly because the government knew that it would impact tribal communities. Today, healthy herds are being rebuilt using assisted reproductive technologies developed by George Seidel and others at CSU. CSU is known for this in a general sense. Uh, taking things from the laboratory and making them work in the field. The Yellowstone herd is an excellent herd for doing uh, restoration or starting new herds from. And the only problem is that it is infected with brucellosis. A lot of times mothers who have brucellosis can have sickly or weak calves that don't often survive. Our goal is to use assisted reproductive techniques such as artificial insemination and embryo transfer to be able to generate offspring that do not have brucellosis but that have the valuable genetics that we want. It's just nice that we can kind of pick up that story and begin to establish some public herds and tribal herds again. In 2015, CSU released its first healthy bison herd at Soapstone Prairie North of Fort Collins. We were able to invite up um, some elders of tribes that have been in this part of the country for well before it was even the United States. We heard the first hoof prints on the ground and we were welcoming back our ancestors. We were welcoming them home. Recognizing and realizing that this land belonged to indigenous people is really important. We are still part of this community. We are still stewards of this land. We care deeply about it. In 2017, CSU released a statement officially recognizing this importance. The goal of the land acknowledgement 
provides an opportunity for both indigenous folks and non-indigenous folks to remember that history, to honor it, to think about it, to be educated on it, and then think about present day, what are we gonna do? Every college campus is a small reflection of the larger society. We have had racial incidences, um, bias incidents, especially against our Jewish students and our Muslim students. We have hundreds of people across campus working on diversity issues. We're here to ensure that students have their civil rights protected. I encourage students to continue to advocate for their needs because when they do is, is when the institution shifts and moves. At President McConnell's inauguration, there was a protest led by black students saying you need to address these racist incidents. President McConnell was like, what can I do? Right? What, what else can we be doing that we haven't done before? And so she then came up with a race bias equity initiative. Helping people from very diverse backgrounds feel like they belong and that they matter and that they're honored, I think is incredibly significant. As long as there's racism, there's going to be challenges to racism and the question of how to best address this. For our country and our world, we better figure that out because this is our future. And instead of being afraid of it, we need to embrace it. Most of us said, did you ever imagine this would happen to us in our lifetime? And yes, it's frustrating and people want answers and we don't have all the answers yet. In March of 2020, Colorado State University shut down its campus in an international effort to stop the COVID-19 pandemic. I alerted campus leaders that we needed to move all on-campus operations online and virtual. Some people have found that they actually like their classes online, that they didn't think they would, and there are other students that are really struggling with it. We all have to figure out how we take responsibility, keep moving on, and yet be able to do that in a way that saves lives. As COVID-19 brought a shortage of personal protective equipment, Colorado manufacturers reached out to CSU's Department of Design and Merchandising for help. They don't know what the material to choose from and how to assess the quality of the product. That's how we are helping here. Smart Textiles and Nanotechnology Research is also innovating medical fabrics that detect viruses. A good example is the face mask um, that can detect COVID-19. The idea is basically um, you walk around and you notice some color change on, on your mask. That, that is an indication, some kind of uh, contamination. From smart fabrics to treatments and vaccines, CSU researchers are joining the fight against the deadly virus. We are a resilient institution. We have great leadership here. We have great students here and staff and faculty. We have to believe in our greatness. I always say we should approach every problem with an open heart and an open mind. And I think that that's what drives a good land-grant university into the future. This is the quietest, most understated, globally preeminent university in the entire world. That when you come to Colorado State University, um, you'll feel like you can have an impact on the world, and absolutely you will. For 150 years, the great experiment that is Colorado State University has been evolving and transforming the world in unimaginable ways. People had the hope that gave rise to land-grant universities. And so history provides us that sense of it's possible. Are the possibilities of tomorrow rooted in the past? And if so, what path will they follow? I always say this to our players, our team, success is not a straight line.
Oval was originally a hayfield. At some point, somebody had the idea of planting elms. They weren't the beautiful elms that we stand under today while those people were alive. But they planted the seeds and they had the vision for what it could be. And that's what I, I hope we're able to do, but only if we stand on the platform of history that allows us to see clearly the future.